Well, hello, uh, Saddlebackers. It's always great to uh, be here with you. I, um, I know what you might be thinking. With this shirt, I'm trying to be like Brick. <laughs> well, I'm not. I have socks on, so <laughs> not exactly. I might be trying to be like Rick. Maybe this will help me preach better. I don't know. But anyway, this is my first Hawaiian shirt sermon, so aloha to you all. And I, I, I just lost a wager with a friend of mine, and so here I am. I also am supposed to use the word of the little animal, the ferret, uh, in the message, so I did that too. So anyway, all that's taken care of. You know, the first time I ever preached at Saddleback, we were, it was kind of like this. We were in a tent. And I still remember the three points. I didn't, I didn't get them from the Bible. I got them from my mother. Uh, it's always something. Number two was, if it's not one thing, it's another. And number three, you never know. And it really uh, has proven to be uh, true uh, in every sense of the word. I, you, know, you never know. I remember when our biggest worry was murder hornets uh, invading you know, three years ago. Who cares about that now with COVID and all that we're going through? I want to start today uh, with a scripture. It's not on your notes there, but it's Romans 12, 2. And it instructs us to not copy the behavior of the, of the world or the customs of the world, but let God transform you. And in the New Living Translation, it says, let, let God transform you into a new creature, a new person, by changing the way that you think. It's amazing that we can be transformed. If we're open to giving up a few misperceptions or ideas that aren't exactly on track, if we'll do that, God can transform us. And then it says that um, we will, if we'll do this today, if we're willing, that we can learn to know God's will, which is good and pleasing and perfect. But if you think that it's too late, or God has given up on you, or, or you've given up on God, it's not going to happen. Or you get too stressed out, too uh, big into the worries of the day, then it's not going to happen. There's, there will be no transformation. And so this series on strategies for stressful times, well, I've never seen times so stressful as these, so much disconnection with the COVID thing and, and so much confusion. I, I was confused from my early days. I, I literally thought if you were a liar, your pants would actually catch on fire. We need truth, not things that are confusing. And so what I want to talk about is how do we triumph over these very, very stressful times? How do we have a victory and how do we do that? Not with some concept of God, but with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And so I've come up with six different things that I think the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, would say to us today going through these very, very difficult times. God who created the universe, Jesus, His Son who came, lived, showed us how to live, and taught us, died for us, was buried after crucifixion. God, God brought him out of the grave. He ascended into heaven, is there now. And the Holy Spirit, this supernatural comforter, this convictor of our sins, and then the, the Spirit that empowers us to have victory over temptation and over sin. And so we begin with, I think the Trinity would say, whatever your this is that you're going through, that we've got this. We've got this. And, you know, God is big enough, great enough, and amazing enough to be able to handle whatever it is that you're going through. Think about it. The observable universe is 46.5 billion light years wide. That's just what we can see. And a light year, well, light travels 6 trillion miles in a year. So 46.5 billion times 6 trillion, that's how big the universe is that we can see. Trillions of galaxies in it. Our galaxy alone, oh my goodness, 100,000 times 6 trillion miles wide. Just our 
galaxy, the Milky Way. Anywhere from two to 400 billion planets and stars in our Milky Way. And in all of this vastness, is there any evidence of life anywhere, even a cell? No. We have sent probes. We've got these big ears that listen for even a, a little beam or a, a, a piece of static or anything that indicates there's life. There's this spaceship called the Voyager. It's got a little plaque on it with all this code and everything and a, and a couple of, uh, of naked people on there to show people what we look like. I think they'd see that and they would just think, that's the weirdest looking thing I've ever seen. What, you know, and, and it, nothing. Billions of dollars, nothing. So if all of that is out there and we're the only peoples that God has, if he can handle all that, he can surely handle whatever it is that you have going for you. He gave you life. There's no life out there except right here. Here's where life is. United States, 30% of the world lives in a country as free as ours. Only 30%. We have won the lottery whenever we are conceived. It's amazing, this gift. We want to make the best of it. And the way we do that is to acknowledge that the creator of the universe is powerful enough to handle whatever it is that you're going through. Whatever your this is, well, the Trinity has it. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. It says it so clearly. No matter who we think God is or what he feels about it. Look at this. Matthew 18, 28. 30. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. But we have to surrender whatever it is to Him and take on His burden, which is light, versus all the stuff that we're trying to control and trying to change and cure in all these things that we do. You know, during COVID, my wife and I, we've never spent so much time together. And it's just been uh, all fabulous. <laughs> Except for all those times that she has to ask, do you have to do that right now? <laughs> A little bit of uh, annoying stuff that I do. And then, you know, she probably the most common thing she said in the past two years is yelling what from the other bedroom. And you know, men, here's a little tip. When a woman says what, she, she heard you. She's not asking you to say it loud. She absolutely understood what you, you said. She is giving you the opportunity to, re, to restate or retract, reconsider whatever it was. So she says what, and you just got to say, oh, nothing. No, let, let, we'll let that go. And women, here's a little tip for you. If, us, if we put something on our to-do list, we are going to do it. And you don't need to ask us about it every six months. It is going to get done. Just a couple of tips to make things better. But I'm telling you, marriage is tough anyway. And, and in this, this time, it's really tough. There was a guy, 50-year anniversary. And he comes down the stairs. Got a little tear in his cheek right there and his wife said oh honey you know she's fixed the breakfast he loves it makes me feel so so wonderful that you're you're emotional today on our 50th anniversary what are you feeling what are you thinking he said well you remember 50 years ago you were pregnant and your dad came over with a shotgun and said if you don't marry my daughter i'm gonna lock you up for 50 years i would have been a free man today Anyway, that, that's just horrible. I'm sorry I had to do that. But, but it just points out that, you know, we don't have to have a marriage like that. We, it, God can transform each of us. And I know many of you are glad to be here with the person that you care about so that they will listen to the message and change. But really, this is for you and not them. Here's another 
thing I think the Trinity wants to say to us is that we can work with that. You know, you're going along and you, you make mistakes and God says, okay, that's what you're going to do. I'll, I'll work with that. He doesn't give up on us. Here's the proof. Look at this um, Romans 8.28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Everybody's called to a purpose. And you say, yeah, well, He makes everything work together for the good of those that are called. Well, everybody's called. And if you think that He called you, but then you messed up and now He's done, it isn't true. Now, a lot of people here worshiping God have sports teams and stuff that's being recorded at home. I am a failure in that area. But I'll tell you this, every episode of Flea Market Flip I have recorded, that is my favorite show. They take a piece of junk, damaged and broken, and then they make it into something really valuable and they sell it. And, and they repurpose this dumb thing into something amazing. And I think that is exactly what God is saying here. He says, just like flea market flip, I can take your broken stuff and I can repurpose it and I can put you right back into the calling that I had for you to begin with. Rick wrote the purpose-driven life. I, I would like to write the repurpose, forgiven life, because that's what God wants all of us to experience. And, and you're not going to if you think you've blown it and there's no hope. But let me tell you, there is hope. And here's the uh, evidence right out of Scripture. My wife and I have just finished, if you can imagine this, our 18th Bible project. We're Bible commentators for Tyndall House Publishers. And uh, she finished uh, every woman's Bible, be out in a couple of years. And both of us, she did the uh, one-year Bible for women, and I did the one-year Bible for men, where I had to write 37,200 words for every day. In the one-year Bible, there's an Old Testament passage, a New Testament passage. There's a psalm and a proverb every day. You open up the Bible, there it is, and in a year you get through it all. So, by the way, when she sends stuff to the publisher, they send her emails back. Oh my goodness, we don't believe anyone's ever thought this before. What an amazing thing, and even your pentameter is beautiful, and, and when I send stuff in, they send emails back. Well, we'll try to get this through 18 different editors, try to create something that'll be worthy of people reading, and thanks for the effort. But anyway, I come over here in February, and I open up, and the Old Testament passage, there's Aaron, the first high priest, and he's worshiping a golden calf. Now, if you've ever had a bad hire, hired somebody that didn't work, God knows what you're going through. I mean, you don't get much bigger of a failure than worshiping a golden calf when you're chosen to lead people to worship God. Then you go over to the New Testament. Here's the same day. New Testament, there's Peter who's supposed to establish the church for Christ. And he says, I, I, I don't even know who he is. Three times he's denying Jesus on the same day that I read about Aaron worshiping a golden calf. Now, did God, did Christ say, okay, that's it. You had your chance. Let's get James up here. He'll do it. Let's get somebody else. No. They were restored to their calling. And Aaron maintained that calling. And Peter maintained that calling. And I believe that that is, that is what God has for all of us. We need to live into the calling that Christ has for us. None of us will ever, I think, mess up any worse than that. That's horrible. But God is a God of great mercy. And you know, you have to make the choice that you are going to be with God. You're going to follow God. You're going to do something different. You're going to leave, leave some things behind that you don't need or are causing damage. You have to make that choice. It's not easy. There was a, a guy, he was Jimmy the Juggler, and he juggled for kids' birthday parties. And there was a sick child, and and he needed to go and juggle for the, the birthday party, and he was late. And he had his little pins over here by him in the, 
seat and he's speeding off to get there and he's so sad that he's going to be late. Sure enough, a policeman pulls him over. He, policeman walks up. He says, oh, officer, please don't give me a ticket. I'm Jimmy the juggler. Look, these are my juggling pins. I'm not lying to you. I've got to go juggle for this sick little boy. I, I've got to get there and he's going to be so disappointed. And he just opens the door and he grabs these pins and he says, look, I, I promise you I'm telling the truth. Look, I can juggle. And about that time, a guy and his wife, I think they might have been leaving Celebrate Recovery. The guy looks over his wife and says, man, am I ever glad I stopped drinking when I did? Because you would not believe what they're making people do to prove that they're sober. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't get better. It's going to get worse. And now is a great time to make the change before it gets Worse, but I know you're not going to do that if you're stressed about every little thing or if you don't think God is a God who is rich in mercy, which He is. The third thing is I think the Trinity would say we want you to work with us and do your part. Too many people are waiting for God to do what God is waiting for them to do. And God needs us to go to work. We've got work to do. We have, we have to be able to see who we are and go to work on, on who we are. There was a, a couple that walked up to this art gallery and, and uh, right there in the foyer, there was a, a, this ornate frame and this old man, he's all bent over, he looks over there and he goes, honey, look at this. This is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Why would this be hanging in an art gallery? And she said, Honey, that's a mirror. You know, it, it's, it's not easy to see the reality of who we are. But look at this verse. Look at this scripture, James 1, through 25. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror, you see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, God will bless you for doing it. We need to be about doing the next right thing. You know, we, we can cope with stress with deep breathing, or we can do something far richer and stop seething over somebody and forgive and give the grace to someone else that God has given to us. For some people, exercise is good, but an exorcism maybe is you need to be delivered. But even if we're delivered from something, no one's ever delivered from this thing into character or Christian maturity. I know people who wake, they wake up one day and they, they have no craving for alcohol or drugs. But that doesn't make them a person of character. That requires growth from the soul out. All of us have work that we need to do, but we have to see it. We have to be willing to look at ourselves. And the Holy Spirit will help us. It convicts us of the areas we need to work on. Then it supernaturally gives us the power to work on them and the comfort that we need in the process. Just to do the next right thing. That's what God wants from us. To obey and do the next right thing. Now, the fourth Thing I think the Holy Spirit would say is that when you do your part, we will help you with the parts that hurt. Not all hurt is harmful at all. Sometimes we have to hurt. You know, when, when you lose someone to death, um, it's so painful. But when you go through a grieving process, it's a gift from God so that once you properly grieve, you don't have to feel every day like it happened the day before. There's healing that's there. But you have to go through that painful grieving process, and if you delay that or ignore that need, then you'll experience this pain for years to come. So we, we need to hurt sometimes 
so that we don't just get through something, but we get over it and we get beyond it. You know, at New Life, we've been working with people who hurt. And it's not our mission to help them feel better. We want them to feel better about their lives and about God. And sometimes they need more hurt to be healed. When, when I started 33 years ago, started New Life, we're still going, had the best years ever. But my motto was going to be, we love hurting people. But it didn't, it didn't work, so we changed that. But, but hurt is something that is required. And sometimes you've been traumatized and you need to go to a specialist that can help you with that trauma. And thinking that everything can just be fixed with greater faith or whatever, it just isn't true. Back in uh, the 1800s, the greatest preacher ever was Charles Spurgeon. I think Rick's great-grandfather became a, a, a believer uh, under his ministry in England. Spurgeon became a Baptist at age 15. And uh, before he was 20, he had his first church. And at 21, he was the most famous person in Europe, but probably in the whole world. 100 million copies of his sermons were distributed around the world back in those days. So in October 1858, he decides that he, because no place could seat all the people that wanted to hear him, he decides that he's going to preach in the Royal Surrey Gardens in London, a place where there had been some questionable plays and acts and things, and all the preachers that were jealous of him criticized him for preaching on the devil's stage. This night in October, when he's going to preach his first sermon there, it was packed. They said that horses and buggies, they were still, and cars, both were lined up for seven miles to try to get in. He had a great sense of humor. He, he still uh, rode in a horse and buggy. And the critics, they said, you know, it's so sad that on the Sabbath, here on Sunday, you, you would work your horses rather than give them a day of rest. He said, I have Jewish horses. <laughs> they rest on Saturday. So, great sense of humor. I love this guy. When he was about to get up to speak, some people stood up and yelled fire, and there was no fire. But everyone stampeded out of that huge, huge arena. Seven were trampled to death. Twenty-eight were trampled and many critically injured. And, and here he was, this young guy, just doing what God wanted him to do. And it was devastating. When they helped him out, here were all these mangled bodies and blood and brokenness and death. And he, he made it home. He had a wonderful, loving wife. He went to bed for two weeks, stayed in the fetal position, Suicidal sometimes. He just didn't understand. Well, he got through it, but it seems like he never really got over it. You know, today, if you have been traumatized, there are, there are Christian counselors that specialize in, in trauma, and they can help you so that you're not continuing to experience post-traumatic anything. And I've heard people say, well, you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul didn't have a counselor. Well, no, he didn't have a dentist either, but I'm sure he would have loved it if that had been there. We can't judge something because they didn't have that. Well, Spurgeon went on to, I mean, he started a university, orphanages, but he only preached about nine months out of the year. He died at age 58. The other three months, he would be in bed with deep depression, sometimes suicidal. 
Sometimes he would be preaching and he would just sink into the depression and fall to the stage and they would have to drag him off. You see, he got through it, but I don't think he ever got over it. They didn't know all the stuff we know about the difference between being hurt and some kind of horrific trauma. And so I don't think he ever got over it. And I don't think he got beyond it. But that's what God wants for us. He says this in 2 Corinthians 1.4, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. So it's not just that He comforts us through it. He comforts us so we can get over it and beyond it and then reach out and help other people. The fifth thing that I think the Trinity would say to us in tough times is we're a we. The Trinity is a we. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We want you to be part of a we. You know, the person that says all I need is God and my Bible is obviously not reading the Bible that they say that it's all they need. Because there are so many one another's in there. So many things. Like James 5.16, confess your sins one to another. Paul wrote to the Philippians. Philippians 2.2 2, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. We need each other. And... Um, and we all have these gifts, supernatural spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit that are there so we can minister to each other. And you can't ever brag if you have this gift and you do it well because it's a supernatural gift. What seems easy to you, somebody else doesn't even think about it. In one week, three people told me I had this gift, this spiritual gift. It's kind of an interesting gift. I hadn't really thought about it until they said it. But they said, Steve, you have the gift of hospitality. Well, I think it's true. If you were to come to our house and spend the night, I would be the one that would just naturally go to your room, make sure everything's straight. I'd put a little pitcher of water in a glass by the bed, put a little chocolate x lax on the pillow. Just, you know, I'm the one that would do those little things because I have the gift of hospitality. Can't brag about that. It just, don't even think about it. It just happens. All of us, had these gifts. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages while another is given the ability to interpret what's being said. Now, all of us have these gifts and sometimes we don't even know what they are and we need to find these gifts and come together and minister with these gifts. Um, I'm going to... I love to write, and I've been writing since 1984. It was my first book. And so I'm going to do this uh, Ultimate Writers Conference in March next year with Jerry Jenkins and Lee Strobel and all these people because we want to share this gift because we think so many people have a book in them and they've just never gotten the formula and all this because we want to minister to people by helping them unleash their special gift. You have a gift. And God wants to use that gift. But you have to be willing to learn what it is, discover what it is, and then use it for the body of Christ. Now, coming to church is all about worshiping God and serving others and experiencing God's love and loving others. But there are some benefits to coming to church. We don't want to come to church. Just like you don't want to give money because you think you're going to get more money back. That's like betting on God. Go to Vegas and bet there. God will reward you for giving, but not money right back, even though many preachers on 
television with big hair tell you that that's true. No, you give because you're grateful. Well, you come to church to worship God and love God and experience God. But I'm telling you, there are some benefits. And of all of the institutions that did the study that I just found last week, it was Harvard University. They did a study with 70,000 participants over 16 years on what is the benefit of going to church every week. One benefit was that you were 33% less likely to be dead at the end of the 16 years than those that did not go to church. So it's a health club here. You are 30% less likely to be depressed, five times less likely to commit suicide if you go to church every Sunday, and 50% less likely to be divorced if you go to church every every Sunday. It's amazing. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you want a great stress-reducing strategy, do not divorce. I mean, you have made someone miserable. Don't go divorce and marry somebody else and make them miserable. Stick right there. Don't spread this thing around. And, you know, the research shows that if you hate the person you're with, uh, you know, going to a seminar to learn to communicate better is not going to help. Learning to tell someone you hate them better is not, that's not good. You need to transform it. Five years after the people that hate each other work on it, stay together, uh, versus the people that divorce, the, the happiness is exponentially greater for those that work it out and stay together. And you know, marriage is grand. And in California, divorce is at least 100 grand, and you do not want that expense. And, uh, and the effect on your children is horrible. Plus, you're going to go on Match.com when it's all done. And they're going to match you with your ex. Same neighborhood, same interests, same number of kids. Go to the same church. Just save your money. And work on that marriage. It is, it's not easy. And when you come to church, you learn about forgiveness and acceptance. And, and we need that because we're all kind of, you know, messing up here or there. This one guy, his wife couldn't hear very well. And he says, honey, I'm so proud of you. She didn't even look up. She couldn't hear him. So a little louder, he says, honey, I'm proud of you. Nothing. So he yells, honey, I'm proud of you. And she looks at him and says, and I'm tired of you too. <laughs> so you can get it wrong. It's easy. This one woman... She, she took a picture of herself at the store, a new dress, and she sent the picture to her husband. And he loved her so much. And she said, honey, do I look like a cow in this dress? And he, he loved her and he texted back, no, no, but it auto-corrected to moo, moo. <laughs> it's, ah. So we need grace and acceptance. And, and forgiveness. But going to church, 50% less likely to divorce. And, and longevity is just one of the amazing things and less depressed and less stressed, greater satisfaction. When you go to the doctor, he ought to be, you know, if you've got problems, he ought to be saying, so, how's your church attendance going? I mean, that's the... That's the thing. Let me read a quote from this study. It says this, our research, this is Harvard, suggests that church attendance specifically, rather than private practices or self-assessed religiosity or spirituality, most powerfully predict health. How much you go to church predicts health. You know, I go to the doctor, he says, so how much bacon are you eating? I, that is none of his business. Bacon is sacred. That is between God, me, and the pig. I, ask me about church attendance. That's, that's a bigger indicator of how I'm doing than how much bacon I consume. And you know, go to church, you must, you must really be committed. And you must be a, a forgiving human being. 
The, the uh, health food doctor, Dean Ornish, who was the one that got people uh, eating food that tastes like hay, um, he, he said this. Uh, rather than hay, he said forgiveness is probably the greatest thing you could do for your personal health is to forgive someone and quit carrying that around. So there are benefits. And the Holy Spirit would say, we want you to be a we. you got to show up. You can't do this just on your own. You need the we. And if you surrender to God's truth, the sixth thing is this. I think the Trinity would say to us, we hold your future, and we know it's going to be okay. It's, it's not going to work out perfectly. It's not going to be the way you prefer it, probably, and it's not going to be without pain. But it's going to be okay. Five years ago, you were really stressed out about some stuff. Probably don't even remember what it was. Because it's been a, it's been a while, and things turn out okay. And in five years, you'll look back and say, well, it's okay. If you have Christ as your Savior, it is ultimately going to be okay. We're going to all be together with Him in heaven. And so, he says this, 1 Peter 5, 6, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. And Isaiah 48, 4, I will be your God throughout your lifetime until your hair is white with age. I made you and I will care for you. I will carry you along and save you. God is for you. God loves you. He created you. He is rich in mercy. And He has made a place for you in His heart. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3-5 three through five says, But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. And we're confident in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we commanded you. May the Lord lead your hearts into a full understanding and expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. God is so for us. Jeremiah, this great prophet, in Jeremiah 6, 16, he says this. He says, this is what the Lord says. So it wasn't his opinion. Straight from God. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in its path and you will find rest for your souls. Perhaps today you're at a crossroads and you can say yes to something that looks good or you can say no. One of the most stress-reducing words ever, two letters, no. No, I will not do what looks good. I will do what is right. I will not do what feels good. I will do what feels good makes me feel good about myself in the long run. I will follow that godly path, doing the next right thing, and I won't be stressed. I will be at rest with my soul. That's the gift of following God. In the worst of times, He's for you, doesn't say that God is loving. It says He is love. He created you. He loves you. He's for you. He's rich in mercy. Doesn't want you to live in shame. Jesus paid a big price so that you don't have to live in shame. And so I am hoping and I am praying that today you might say, let's be at a crossroads. Let's ask for that godly way and walk in that path. And you know, Jeremiah was so wonderful and powerful. And then you look in the uh, New Testament where Paul writes in Ephesians 3.20 that God will do for you 
if you'll just surrender to Him, so much. He will accomplish so much you can't even think it up or even ask for it. It's so amazing. And so if your life is a little bit on the stress side and lacking in amazement, maybe today you could choose. Now, you have to make the choice. Uh, I don't think there's any book on Amazon entitled The Power of Passivity. It just, you have to choose and make a bold move. And I pray that for you. Let me pray for you. God, I pray anyone listening to my voice, God, that the Holy Spirit would touch them, that your divine hand of strength, healing, mercy, love, and grace would fill their hearts and they would turn to you and watch how amazing life can be in the midst of the most stressful times. Give people victory in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I ask these things. Amen. Thank you, Saddleback. Great to be here. God bless you. Have a great, great day.